Hi, and thank you for joining us here at plcgurus.net. You're watching another video as part of our Networking Essentials video series. So if you like this video and want to see more videos like it, do subscribe to our YouTube channel, which I'll post a link to here. Um, and if you do find it useful, please do click the like button below. And one plug for our blog site, you can head over to www.plcgurus.net and become an active member in our community. Okay, so in this video, what we plan to do is demystify what all of these IP addresses, subnet, gateways, what does all of this mean? And really what we're going to find is it's nothing more than an address which uniquely identifies a computer PC or PLC on a network so that communication can happen. So you can see here I have a typical Class C private address uh, IP address that is at 192.168.1.10 so that would be the IP address of the Ethernet bridge that's currently residing in my control logics chassis in slot number one and you also see I have something called a subnet mask at 255.255.255.0 and then we may or may not have something called a default gateway at 192.168.1.254 so I'm going to go ahead and explain in explicit detail what each of these addresses mean, how they resolve into a binary encoding that a computer or processing unit can, can really understand. So let's break it down. To a computer, the IP address above in its current form is meaningless. That's right. It doesn't mean anything to a computer, a PLC, or any kind of computational device. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look. Okay, when I say meaningless, maybe I was being a little bit harsh. What I mean to say is we as humans use the IP address, subnet, and gateway in that form so that it's easy for us to read and it's easy for us to remember. So remember, computers can only read high and low signals, which translate into binary ones and zeros. So if you think about it, if we oversimplify it, a computer or a PLC for that matter is really just a collection of on and off switches. So to a computer or PLC, the address 192.168.1.10 is interpreted as 11000000.1010100.0000000001.0001010. Okay, I may have too many zeros or ones in there, I'm not sure. But as you can see, if we had to remember addresses like this, I mean, it would be a complete nightmare. So the 192.168.1.10 in a binary encoding translates into what you see in front of you. And well, yeah, that is definitely a mouthful. And you can see that it's grouped or categorized into eight bits. Each bit or each byte, sorry, corresponds to one octet in the complete address. So the 10 would correspond to these eight bits. The one here would correspond to these eight bits. The 168 corresponds to these eight bits. And then of course the 192 corresponds to e these eight bits. So there are four bytes. Each byte is referred to as an octet in the complete address. Yeah, that really is a mouthful. Okay, so the IP address really identifies two things. First and foremost, it identifies the network. And second, it also identifies the clients or host devices on that network. And this could be anything ranging from PLCs to PCs to HMIs to drives, any Ethernet device that you want to put out on your industrial network. So how is this accomplished? Well, the subnet mask. Enter the subnet mask. So let's get into what the subnet mask is because it's, it is a very important uh, piece to this IP addressing puzzle. Okay, so looking at our example address scheme above, we had an IP address of 192.168.1.10. 
Now that we knew that translated, as we discussed previously, to the 11000, etc., 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 as indicated by the arrows, each octet from a decimal to binary is translated in this way. Now we have something called the subnet mask. So the function of the subnet mask, really, and in our example was 255252550. Well, what does that translate to? Well, when you convert 255 decimal into binary, what it represents is 11111111.1111111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111.1111
So if you haven't watched my video on IP communication types and what broadcast messages are, I do encourage you to check out our video on that, and I'll include a link here to that video as well. So to summarize, we have allocated, and this doesn't always have to be the case. The subnet mask doesn't always have to be as it is here. I mean, most commonly in industrial networks, in private Class C networks, you will see a 11111.111.111 or 255.255.255.0 subnet mask, but that doesn't have to be. But when we do do that, we limit ourselves to the number of hosts or client devices on the network to between 0 and 255 minus the 0 and 255. So effectively, we have 254 usable IP addresses. Okay, so let's do a quick test. So what if we did go ahead and change the subnet mask in our previous example to 255.255.0.0? Hmm, what is the new network identifier? What would identify the network in this case? And how many hosts, clients, or PLC, or industrial Ethernet devices can we have on that network that is represented by a subnet mask 255.255.0.0. Let's pause the video, give you a chance to think about that, and using what we know now, see if you can sort it out. Okay, so how did you think you did? Let's take a look. So here's our address, the 192.168.1.0, in binary format, of course, because that's the only way the computer understands it, or PLC understands it. Then we have the 255.255.0.0 subnet mask laid out here uh, in binary format as well. And now we go ahead and run our IP address through the mask. So you can see here we have all one, so 192 is part of the network identifier. Good. And then in this portion or this octet of the mask, we have all one, so 168 is part of the network identifier. Okay. So that's pretty much similar to what we had before, but notice now we have all zeros in the third octet of the subnet mask. So that means that this portion of the IP address here is reserved to assign to hosts. And likewise, the last octet is also zeros in the subnet mask. So that means that these eight bits or this entire octet is also used to assign to client or host devices. Okay, well that's going to change some things. So in this case, 192.168.0.0 is the network identifier. And we can have a maximum of 65,534 hosts or clients or PLCs, HMIs, what have you, on your network all talking to each other on this network. Wow, that's a lot of devices. And more or more explicitly, we would have a address range of 192.168.0.1 through 192.168.255.254. Wow, that is a lot of addresses all on the same network. So of course, you would probably never see this but this is what takes us into something called subnetting, where we can start to get very clever with the subnet mass. We don't have to keep this whole octet zeros. We could just say keep it one 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 zero and give us more usable addresses on this network. So you can see here we have a lot of flexibility and a lot of power by using this subnet mass. So like I said, subnetting is a very powerful networking strategy to really gain control of your network uh, with respect to the number of clients, hosts, addresses that you can have. So you can see here, I have a little table for your reference of common Class C type uh, addressing schemes that use different subnet masks. So you can see the most common one here 
uh, has 256 available addresses, but we know only 254 of those can be assigned to actual devices on our network or hosts on our network because, of course, zero and uh, 255 are reserved for reasons we discussed here. But let's take a look at some of these other addresses here. So you can see here, we have a 255.255.255.252. We only get four usable addresses and two hosts. So moving along here, you see if we have a 255.255.240, we have 4,096 addresses of which 4,094 can be assigned to hosts, etc. So you can see here, depending on what the subnet mask is, really determines what identifies the network and how many hosts or devices we can have on that network. Okay, so what's left here? So IP addresses. We discussed IP address and what the 192.168.1.10 or like or similar address represents. So check mark. Subnet mask. We now understand the function of the subnet mask. So I think we can safely check that one off. So what's left? The default gateway, of course. So what is the default gateway? That, that 192.168.1.254 address we have at the beginning. So everything that we've discussed so far, as far as how the computer resolves this into a binary encoding, et cetera, et cetera, um, so all of that is going to apply here as well, but the default gateway is special in ways that we'll discuss shortly. So let's break it down. Okay, so to explain the default gateway, let's imagine we have a network that has the following topology as illustrated here. So you can see here we have two stratic switches, but it's important to note here that this stratic switch is functioning as a managed switch only, whereas this network switch has routing enabled. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we got here. So the PLC or Logix controller B has an IP address of 192.168.1.10. It has a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0 and a gateway address of 192.168.1.254. The HMI is sitting at IP address 192.168.1.20. Notice the mask and the gateway is the same. And then we have the 1734 uh, safety point IO here sitting at 192.168.1.11. Again, the mask gateway being the same. So you can see that all three of these devices are on the same network, right? How do we know that? Because we know that the network in this case, because of the subnet mask here, is the is 192.168.1. So all of these devices sit on that 192.168.1 network. And then of course that last octet, because of the zero in the subnet mask, uniquely identifies that device on that network. So moving along, we can see the uplink port here of our Stratic switch is connected to the router, um, uh, the router's uplink port or gigabit port here as well. And you can see that this interface here is configured for 192.168.1.254. So how does this work? Okay, well before we do that, let's take a look at what these devices are currently set at. Uh, so you can see the line controller A PLC here is on a 172.16.1.10. And you can see here the subnet mask is the 255.255.255.0. And the gateway in this case is 172.16.1.254. And then the HMI is 172.16.1.20. .1 so you can see that this line control and this HMI is on a completely different network than these guys over here, right? Good. Now let's go back to our interface here. So you can see the interface or the uplink port of our switch. This interface is configured on 192.168.1.254. 
So what is going to happen here? Okay, so let's say that this PLC wants to communicate with the line controller. Well, you can see here, they are on two completely different networks. And when this PLC tries to communicate to this line controller A, it doesn't know how to get there. Like I said, they are on two completely disjointed networks, which is why we need the default gateway, and which is also why we need a router to bridge two different networks. So when this controller realizes that it can't communicate directly to line controller A, it, so, it shouts out to its gateway and says, Hey, gateway, do you know how to get me to 172.16.1.10? And of course, the gateway happens to be the router in this case. And the gateway says, Yes, I am connected to 172.16.1.10. I can get you there. Let's make it happen. And so that's really, I mean, obviously I'm oversimplifying things a little bit here. Um, I mean, this really would, would kind of bridge outside of the scope of this discussion and get into more advanced topics such as routing and VLANing and these types of concepts. But sufficient to say for the purpose of this video, the gateway address functions as a mechanism to bridge two disjointed networks so that they can communicate. I hope that makes sense. So to summarize, the default gateway provides a mechanism for host clients on one network to communicate with host clients on another completely different network. Okay, so just a recap, IP addresses, Check. We know what these are and what they're used for and how they're, they're made up. Subnet mask. Check. We know the function of the mask. We know how it's composed. We know how we can manipulate the mask to change the network identifier and give us more or less clients on any given network. And then, of course, the default gateway. Check mark. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you found it informative. Uh, please do uh, subscribe to our channel and check our website and become a guru at www.plcgurus.net.